Hi everyone, I am Marley McNeil, a member of the Board of Directors for Crohn's and Colitis Canada, and I'm really happy to be here today to welcome you to the webinar. Uh, for all of the webinars that we're doing in this Gutsy Learning Series and the special COVID ones as well, you'll probably be seeing a different organizational stakeholder like me uh, coming along to open these sessions. Uh, it's a way for us, for you to get to know us better and and I think it's a way for us to learn more about what's important to you. So I live in Halifax, um, where I'm the Chief Operating Officer of an organization called Research Nova Scotia, um, which certainly helps in my role as Chair of Crohn's and Colitis Canada's Research Committee. And being um, a member of that committee has given me a really interesting viewpoint from which I've learned a lot about the amazing researchers and clinicians Clinician, sorry, clinician scientists who are working here in Canada to learn more about Crohn's and colitis. The funds that are raised by, by Crohn's and colitis Canada help support the work of these researchers as they search for cures and for ways to, to improve the lives of those who are living with IBD. The Gutsy Learning Series, um, which we're going to be uh, starting in a few minutes, uh, was created actually by our guest speaker. Uh, to inform you about the work of these researchers and clinicians and to provide you with the latest evidence in IBD care and management. Every day people are turning to Crohn's and Colitis Canada for trusted information. They're going to our website and they're watching our webinars um, to, to get information and, and to inform themselves. So far this year we've actually held four times more people than we had in 19, uh, 2019. And we're really proud to be the organization that you're turning to for trusted information. And I hope you'll find this information um, both tonight and the, the information we're going to be presenting at our future events uh, to be as helpful as uh, you've indicated the previous things we've done for you have been. Um, so just to kind of give you a bit of a heads up, the next COVID-19 and IBD webinar will take place on December 7th in French and December 17th in English. In addition, on the 29th of November, we're hosting the Jacqueline Fisher Education Symposium, which will feature IBD experts with information to help prepare for GI appointments, transition from pediatric to adult care, and other significant life events. We hope you can join us for all of these informative online activities. While a lot has changed in the past nine months or so because of the pandemic, one thing remains very clear, and that's this organization's commitment to everyone impacted by Crohn's or colitis. The team at Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to find a cure for IBD and to improve the quality of life for everyone affected by these chronic diseases. Lots of things have changed, that one never will. So, now on to the reason that you've chosen to spend your time with us today. And, and just a quick reminder uh, to uh, reflect what Kate said earlier, that this will be recorded and will be available on our website. We're so pleased to have Dr. John Marshall here to discuss symptom management and complications of IBD. Dr. Marshall is a professor of medicine and director of the Division of Gastroenterology at McMaster University as well as a gastroenterologist at Hamilton's Health Sciences, Hamilton Health Sciences, sorry, in Hamilton, Ontario. He is a full member of the Farncombe Family Digestive Health Research Institute as well. Dr. Marshall's publications include over 200 academic papers and book chapters and over 250 abstracts. He's received several awards from the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology and has held prestigious fellowships in both the American Gastroenterological uh, Society, uh, sorry, Association, and the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. In his, um, and I'm doing the air quotes, spare time, uh, Dr. Marshall is co-leading with Dr. Naraj Narula, a research project with Crohn's and Colitis Canada's My Gut App, a digital program that allows patients and healthcare teams to monitor disease progress between appointments. So with all of that that's going on, we're really appreciative of the fact that Dr. Marshall has made time to be with us and share all from his great um, wealth of knowledge. 
and um, I hope we take advantage of asking questions and making sure that we learn as much as we can this evening. So welcome, Dr. Marshall, and it's over to you. Great. Well, thanks uh, very much to, to Kate and Marley for that generous uh, introduction. I'm happy to, to speak to you, and it's great to see well over 200 people here uh, listening in. It's a shame we can't be all together in a room, but in many ways, I think this kind of platform actually works a little, even a little better. I think I have to be given control of the slides in order to advance. There we go. So I thought I'd start with this. I thought I'd give you a bit of background in terms of uh, some of the numbers out there and also some slides after this. It'll give you a bit of an insight into kind of what your caregivers, your physicians and nurses are, are thinking about managing IBD in 2020. This was from uh, a burden of illness report that Crohn's and Colitis Canada helped support to try to get an idea of, uh, among other things, how common uh, IBD is in Canada. And I think the number on the lower right is important to recognize that uh, the number of people living with IBD in Canada continues to increase. And it's been estimated that by 2030, that number will cross 1%, which is, uh, I think, uh, 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 higher than many people would have otherwise thought. 1% of the Canadian population by 2030 will be living with a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. So we're thinking here about the, the impact of IBD, the burden of IBD. And of course, we can talk about numbers, which is what this is. We could talk about dollars in terms of uh, the costs of IBD on society, both to manage it, but also the cost uh, when people are taken out of the workforce and, and don't achieve the educational goals they want. Uh, you can talk about those numbers, but I think tonight we're really gonna be talking about the impact of IBD uh, on all of uh, those of you who are patients uh, living with IBD and, and the symptoms really, which are uh, disrupting uh, uh, people's lives. We're gonna be talking about really the symptomatic burden of IBD tonight. So uh, this is another important uh, image. When you go to a, one of our medical meetings, this always gets shown to uh, show what really what we're trying to accomplish in managing IBD. And on the left, you see what, what uh, I think used to happen and sometimes still does is that uh, people have uh, flares of disease. That's the black wiggly line across the bottom. The flares come and go, feel well sometimes, you feel sick sometimes, but behind the scenes, you get this accumulation of damage to the gut. And it's that damage with scar tissue that leads to all these complications like fistulas and abscesses and blockages that need surgery. And it's really those things that uh, impair people's quality of life the most. So on the right, the idea is that if you can uh, diagnose people early, if you can recognize when the disease is active, uh, you can start treatment uh, at the right time uh, and perhaps earlier than we all, than we historically have. And you can get the disease under control, maybe prevent those complications from happening. And at the end of the day, let people live uh, more normal lives. lives. That's really what we're, we're trying to accomplish when we treat Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in, in 2020. A challenge, which I think is maybe a theme throughout tonight's presentation, is that unfortunately the, there's not a great correlation between what people feel and what's actually going on inside. And, and this is just a graph showing that the CDAI across the bottom and what we see of the disease when you do an endoscopy, which is the, the vertical axis on you know, going up and down, you can see that there doesn't seem to be a clear relationship between symptoms and the actual inflammation happening in endoscopy. And that is a real challenge in, in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis because uh, uh, we don't really know whether your symptoms reflect active disease. And so I think in 2020, we do a lot more testing, we do a lot more monitoring to try to figure out which symptoms act actually reflect disease activity because that will be the thing that really directs a change in, in treatment. So there's this uh, uh, concept of treat to target in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and it's not unique to inflammatory bowel disease. It, really any condition that we treat in medicine has the same sort of idea behind it, but it's been, um, I think, discussed a lot more you know, when I go to meetings around inflammatory bowel disease. And this is a bit of a complicated slide, but really the idea is that uh, you, you get diagnosed with IBD, uh, you get assessed, we try to figure out, you know, what, where your disease is, what kind of disease it is, and 
is this really a high risk for having complications that might need surgery, say, in the near future, or that might really affect your life in the long run? And all that makes us decide, well, what, what are we trying to aim for? What do we want to achieve in managing the disease? We pick treatments that might help us to reach that target. After a period of time, we say, have we got to where we want to get? If we, if we do, great, we continue to monitor closely and make sure that we stay there. And if we don't, we go back to the beginning and rethink, okay, what are we doing wrong? How can we change the treatment? And how can we do better? And a lot of this we have to, we should be uh, mapping out, not just in our own heads, but with uh, all of you who have a diagnosis of IBD, trying to work together to figure out what we need to do, where do we want to get, how we're gonna get there, and what sort of tests we're gonna do along the way to monitor the, the disease. And that's what we call treat to target. So uh, here, I, I, We've put through this presentation some of the questions that you submitted. So some, one of you asked, how do healthcare providers determine when it would be best to transition from 5-ASA to a biologic or immunosuppressant? So this would be typically in a patient with ulcerative colitis where we use these medications we call 5-ASA. Those are things like Pentassa, Asacol, uh, Mesovant, Silifalk, uh, which are really easy to take benign uh, pills. Uh, but moving on to something which is maybe more effective, but uh, is a bit more challenging because biologics are often injected and there may be some side effects that we need to discuss with you. So when do we make that decision? Well, I think it really reflects the, what I just showed you in terms of treat to target, right? If uh, 5-ASA is not meeting the goals of care, we're not getting where we want to get, and that may often mean that the disease is just not well enough controlled. And we worry that leaving that disease uncontrolled will lead to complications that might need to worse symptoms in the future, maybe some requirement for surgery, well, that would be the time to move on to other uh, other kinds of treatments because we're not uh, reaching the target that we want to reach with uh, the first therapy, which in many cases is a 5-ASA. So this is the goals of care. I uh, kind of went to university in the 80s, so I think of what, was, what life was like in the 80s and what life is like now. And I seen this evolution in our thinking with inflammatory bowel disease over the course of my own career. So right at the beginning, I think the focus is really on symptoms, which I think to many of you sounds like the obvious thing. But yeah, no symptoms. If you were sick, you got medicine. If you felt okay, you didn't get treated, you got left alone until you got sick again, then you get another round of treatment. Uh, I think we started to realize that some of those treatments weren't necessarily good to keep giving you. Things like steroids, we tried to realize we had to try to minimize uh, steroids and that was a change because historically you just got lots of steroids each time you got sick. Started to realize that the real uh, uh, bad life experiences, particularly in Crohn's disease, were related to some of the surgeries and some of the surgical complications. So we got very focused quite rightly on trying to do everything we could to avoid surgery and certainly repeated surgery. But then we really realized that this idea of healing the mucosa, the mucosa is the lining of the gut that really actually controlling the inflammation on the inside was the best way to avoid future steroids, to avoid uh, progressing to surgery. So we got very focused on really more detailed monitoring of the disease, not just relying on symptoms. And that was a real pivot point about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, sort of realizing that monitoring the disease allows us to control it better. Yes, symptoms get better, but more importantly, we then uh, can look further into the future, find a limit of disability and try to give with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis a normal quality of life, a normal life experience. And I think uh, as we got new treatments, as we realized how to monitor the disease better, we really could aim higher and aim to give everybody, uh, as I would say, a normal life experience. That's really what our goal is now in managing uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I don't want to dwell too much on this, but uh, uh, and when people do studies of treatments in inflammatory bowel disease, now we have to think, well, how are you going to assess whether the treatment works? And a lot of regulatory agencies around the world have demanded now that we uh, do two things. We monitor the disease objectively, and that could be something like doing endoscopies as part of the studies that we do, but also manage monitor symptoms, but in a very simplified way. And it's interesting, the terminology has changed. In clinical trials, we no longer talk about symptoms, we use a phrase called patient reported outcomes or PRO. That's the new uh, word for symptoms. We talk about PROs. In Crohn's disease, that's limited to pain and bowel habit. 
in ulcerative colitis that's limited to rectal bleeding in bowel habit. So very simplistic uh, summaries of symptoms. And I think all of you who live with IBD or know people with IBD know it's often a lot more complicated than that. And Crohn's disease can't just be thought of in terms of pain uh, in bowel habit. And I, and I think that's something that we'll cover today. So I say that you should be aware that in, in many ways in our literature, when we go to meetings, symptoms are kind of being demoted a little bit. And it's for some of the reasons that I've talked about, that there's often a poor correlation with how the disease is behaving. Uh, you can feel sick and have not much inflammation. You can feel well and have a lot of inflammation. So we really need to look beyond symptoms. They don't really in themselves predict how the disease is going to behave. And that's why we do these tests to try to really understand what the disease is doing, how it's behaving. We've got this new terminology of patient reported outcomes. And when we do studies that, and we submit studies of new treatments to things like Health Canada and the FDA, uh, they're no longer uh, accepting symptoms as an endpoint. So it really sounds like uh, the science is moving away from prioritizing symptoms and how people feel. But I, I think the points at the bottom are key. They're, at the end of the day, are all healthcare providers. I think we really, as part of that, for our professions, we want people to feel well, both now, but also in the future. And that may be uh, an important point. That that's why we monitor the disease, because we're worried about how you feel today. But I'm, I'm also, I always say, I get paid to worry about how you feel in 20 or 30 years. That's really what my job is, to make sure that the future is bright. And it's the symptoms of course, which are really directly relevant to your quality of life and how you feel. So uh, even though the science is moving away from symptoms, I think in day-to-day -day practice, uh, we have to bring ourselves back and focus on the symptoms that you experience. So what do patients with uh, Crohn's and colitis really uh, care about? This was from a survey in Greece, uh, but it's, I think, relevant to inflammatory bowel disease anywhere in the world. Uh, and it's not really things I've talked about, you know, what the blood tests show, or it's not what the colonoscopy shows. It's really the worries that people feel about uh, side effects of medication, about energy, about pain, about uh, embarrassment related to bowel control, uh, ostomies. People worry about their, their images, uh, loneliness, social isolation. All these things uh, are high in the list of patient concerns. And this group tried to lump these things together. And on the left, it's a bit hard to read, but it's a category of the impact of the disease that's based on uh, people's performance, people's self-image, people's confidence, the impact, the complications of the disease, the worry about the future. Uh, sexual function uh, appeared prominently in that and, and forming relationships and starting families that was an important area of concern as well. Uh, and then body stigma at the bottom, people worry about being embarrassed, about uh, cleanliness, all these sorts of and other people's concerns about uh, you if you're living with IBD. These are really what drive patients and what worry patients, and I think they're important to talk about. So that was a Greek survey from the current era. There's another famous Greek doctor from a few years ago called Hippocrates. And he said that when you're managing patients, we sometimes are able to cure. Unfortunately, that's not a very common thing and really not a possible thing right now with IBD. We often treat, but at the end of the day, we really need to comfort. And I think that comes back to controlling the symptoms that you live with day to day. So uh, perhaps related to this, uh, in Production of Canada has supported being the development of a mobile app called MyGut, uh, which you uh, should be able to download. Uh, this is uh, an app specific to IBD where it allows you to track symptoms, quality of life, uh, activities, and also to uh, uh, get some educational material about uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And the next phase of this, what we're moving towards is using this app to link uh, you to your healthcare provider so that your healthcare provider can uh, access some of these things that you record and have a more immediate way of understanding the symptoms that you're feeling and some of the complications of uh, IBD that you're feeling. And uh, the, the plan is to have this uh, connection made by you getting a specific referral code, for code from your healthcare provider that would allow that provider to access uh, your responses on this app. So. Certainly in the COVID era, this kind of uh, electronic communication, I think, has become even more relevant. And so uh, you should be aware, as 
all of you are engaged with Crohn's and Colitis Canada that uh, this uh, is here and that the great improvements in terms of the, the communication aspect of this are on the horizon and uh, hopefully this will will help you and try to you know make your healthcare providers more aware of how your IBD uh, is affecting you. So we do have an audience uh, poll question, which I think is going to pop up when you get to vote. Um, so if you're living with inflammatory bowel disease, you'd be interested in knowing which of these things uh, you're struggling with. Uh, you can select all that apply, you can accept uh, more than one. Is it di diarrhea and urgency? Is it abdominal pain? Is it fatigue, exhaustion, lack of energy, nausea, vomiting? Or, and or stress and anxiety. And it may be that some of you are dealing with all of these things, but just, uh, just vote and we'll see uh, what's really affecting uh, those of you who are online today. Okay. So a lot of you are dealing with a lot of symptoms. Most of you are having diarrhea urgency, most are dealing with pain, most are dealing with fatigue, a few are dealing with nausea, and uh, certainly stress and anxiety is, is highly prevalent as well. So first of all, I'm sorry to hear that so many of you are struggling with this, but uh, perhaps it's, uh, it's good that we're all here today then. Okay, so um, just, talk through some symptoms. I, I, I don't think I have miracles for you, but we can at least talk about some of the issues. And, and diarrhea and urgency were certainly a common symptom, and it's not surprising when you have a digestive illness like Crohn's or colitis. So a few things here to think about. The first is, uh, is what is diarrhea, which sounds a bit existential, but, you know, uh, diarrhea means different things to different people. Um, and uh, if you just use that word, maybe it doesn't communicate everything that you're feeling. So diarrhea can reflect the frequency that you go to the bathroom. It can reflect the, reflect the volume that's being passed. It can reflect things like urgency uh, to find a toilet. And all those things may have uh, slightly different uh, causes. So it's important to think what diarrhea is. And I will tell you, it's considered the normal human bowel habit is anywhere from three bowel movements a day to three bowel movements a week. So someone going twice a day uh, is not really uh, abnormal. But, you know, but it's, but it's important to, when you're talking to your healthcare provider, actually tell them what you're experiencing, not just saying, I've, I've got diarrhea. That's the first thing. And managing expectations is important, too. And I, I say this because there are scenarios where uh, you really not going to be able to get rid of these things. And a, a good example of people who've gone through major surgery for ulcerative colitis and have an iloanal pouch in place where the small bowel is really connected directly to the anus. It's unrealistic to think that patients in that scenario will not have to deal with diarrhea. And the average person in that situation really goes to the bathroom about eight times a day. It's loose. Uh, you know, and so managing expectations is important. What is possible? Uh, and we'd like to make everyone feel completely well and normal, but sometimes that's not possible. I think the other thing is to try to treat the underlying cause. Uh, uh, diarrhea can reflect lots of things, uh, including active inflammatory bowel disease, active Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So number one on the list, if you've got Crohn's or colitis, is to treat that better uh, in order to bring it under control if there's active inflammation. So treat the underlying disease. You also have to think of things that have maybe aren't directly related to IBD that can cause diarrhea. Uh, these can include infections, of course, uh, There are periodic uh, infections that have nothing to do with IBD. Bile salt malabsorption. It's, uh, some people don't uh, reabsorb their bile very well, and that can cause a lot of diarrhea. And that's particularly an issue in people who've had surgery uh, to remove parts of the small bowel. That can be a common cause of diarrhea that isn't directly related to active uh, IBD. And some people do have this concept of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's a bit controversial, but it's where uh, bacteria may take up residence uh, in parts of the bowel where they're not supposed to thrive and they interfere with your own digestion and compete with you for your food and in doing so create diarrhea. You also think about diet, you know, lots of dietary intolerances are out there and uh, uh, these affect people with and without uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but things to think about that are common would include lactose and dairy products, fructose, uh, you know, corn syrups and, and fruits all have lots of fructose, caffeine, 
Uh, unfortunately, for those of you who love your coffee, it can trigger diarrhea. Sweeteners, and particularly things like sorbitol, which are in sugar-free gums and candies, can in some people cause diarrhea, and alcohol can also contribute. And so you might want to try to cut back on all of those things if you're experiencing this. Too, too much fiber, fiber is a bit of a two-edged sword. It can make diarrhea worse, can make diarrhea better. Fatty foods can be an issue. And if uh, a safe uh, diet, if you're experiencing a lot of diarrhea and it sort of comes and goes, if you're going through a bad phase, is to revert to a brat diet, you know, the banana, rice, applesauce, toast diet, which is very well uh, tolerated. In fact, bananas are a great food for, for diarrhea. Uh, interestingly, there's a little bit of literature suggesting that things like marshmallows might be good, but that's eating a marshmallow only diet uh, may not be uh, in your best interest, but occasionally marshmallows have a bit of uh, gum in them that can, that can give the stool a bit more form uh, for occasional use. You're very aware of the gut-brain access, and we talked about anxiety and stress, we'll come back to that at the end, but often changes in bowel habit are your body's way of expressing internal stress and you know, dealing with uh, stress can often help bowel function as well. Uh, but we often end up treating empirically. If, if you can't find any of these reversible factors, uh, then you know you may just need something to try to slow the bowels down. And uh, what might be on that, uh, that list? So it's just a little slow to change. Uh, along with the things that can help control diarrhea, uh, there are things that uh, act uh, we call opioid receptors. So those are things all vaguely cousins of opium and morphine, but uh, designed to control diarrhea without having the brain effects of the of narcotics. But that, in fact, is Imodium is in that family. There's a prescription therapy similar to Imodium called Lomatil, and there's a newer prescription therapy that can also help diarrhea called Viburzi. These are all options for you. There are, I mentioned bile salt malabsorption as a cause of diarrhea. There are uh, medications that can help to mop up extra bile in the digestive tract. And some of you may have tried these. Uh, Alestir is one, Colested, and is a one that's not very used very often. It's a newer one called Lodalis. But these are all what we call resins. You, you drink them, and as it passes through, it kind of mops up and binds some of the irritants that can cause diarrhea. For some people, uh, uh, using medications that reduce spasm, uh, and these would be medications often used for irritable bowel syndrome, but they can help people with IBD as well. Dicetel, Modulon are a couple. There are people who benefit from probiotic therapy and there are many probiotics on the market. Uh, and it's probably very individual, which one might help an individual person. So a lot of trial and error, but a line is an example of something that's out there. And then there are some antibiotics, which have been studied again, more in irritable bowel syndrome, but there's no reason they couldn't be considered in IBD, such as rifaximin that can help diarrhea uh, as well. Happy to talk about that more in the question and answer, if you like. So there's a question from uh, one of you, why do I experience abdominal pain? That's, that's a tough one to answer uh, because there's a long list of causes for uh, abdominal pain in people with Crohn's and, and colitis. And uh, unfortunately, as some of you may know well, it's sometimes impossible to figure out what is causing uh, pain in an individual. But I put together a little list here of things to consider. Uh, sometimes pain is directly related to IBD. It could be because the bowel is actively inflamed. That's a painful process. It could be related to uh, uh, some of the complications and scar tissue that can form leading to narrowings or strictures that can lead to blockages in the bowel, that can be a cause of pain. As food tries to get through, a lot of spasm above that narrowing, trying to squeeze. And for people with Crohn's disease, probably more Crohn's disease, but can develop adhesions where the bowel is sort of stuck to other parts of the bowel or up against the lining of the belly. And that uh, stickiness can uh, cause a lot of tugging and pulling and pain as well. And of course, if you've got Crohn's disease and you suddenly develop pain, we worry about other things, including infections mm -hmm. like abscesses. But then yeah, those are things related directly to IBD, but then there's a whole list of other things that can cause pain independent of IBD. And that list could probably go on for pages and pages, but you know, having IBD, for example, does not prevent you from having irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, different disorder, but they overlap quite a bit. Plain old constipation, acid reflux, kidney stones and gallstones, and people with Crohn's disease are actually more at risk of kidney stones and gallstones in the general population. Other things like pancreatitis can happen, so you have to kind of keep a very broad uh, 
uh, a very open mind when you have pain, thinking about things not necessarily directly related to IBD. And as I said, it's often hard to prove the source. And in our people, unfortunately, you just need to manage the pain and, and stop hunting. So what is out there for pain? So again, this is one of your questions, what treatment options exist uh, for people with IBD to manage, uh, manage pain? Um, so I, again, some thoughts here. Uh, I think I, what, number one list I would maybe even before this is to say is, is to actually treat your IBD. If the IBD is the cause of the pain, maybe we need to change your treatment to get it under better control. But in general, if, uh, for unexplained and chronic pain, I think your primary care provider becomes part of the circle of care here, and they should really be uh, be engaged with this. We do try to avoid uh, using narcotics. It's just a challenging situation to treat stomach pain with narcotics. Often the requirement for doses uh, creeps up and it's unfortunately we see a lot of people very with very good intentions become fairly dependent on narcotics and it's a real problem. Uh, we try to avoid what we call NSAIDs. That would be things like Motrin, Advil, and Naproxen, as well as aspirin, because there are some data to suggest that those medications can actually make Crohn's and colitis a bit worse. So we try to avoid them if possible. But acetaminophen, or plain Tylenol, is fine if it's helpful. I mentioned the antispasm medications on the slide before. If you like natural therapies, peppermint, peppermint oil. Uh, there are a number of over-the-counter products that contain the uh, peppermint oil in capsules, and that it has some good uh, scientific evidence behind it saying it can help relieve spasm and hence pain. Modifying the diet, uh, you know, if you've got uh, areas of narrowing and experiencing pain, maybe the, it's because food's having trouble getting through. As many of you will know, we talk about low residue diets. We're trying to avoid big particles that don't get digested. That would be things like nuts, peels, and seeds. Uh, and so that low residue diet may make it easier for food to pass and hence less painful. And we also talk often about what's called a low FODMAP diet. Uh, this is trying to avoid foods that, that create a lot of gas as they get digested because it's that gas production, which is often a cause of, of pain. So those are some dietary strategies to consider. Important to manage mental health. I mentioned the relationship between uh, mental health and gut symptoms and pain can be part of that. So if, if people are struggling with uh, anxiety and depression, often the best way to manage stomach pain is actually to manage the anxiety and depression better. And so we have to be very aware of that. Physical exercise can be very good for mental health and for chronic symptoms. And think outside the box. I, I think uh, I'm very open mind to all these other approaches, which can include things like acupuncture, massage therapy, physiotherapy, pelvic physiotherapy, all of which can be helpful to individual patients. And of course, I put cannabis here because in Canada we have to really <laughs> have that list. And I think we need a lot of we need some more evidence on this, uh, but. I, just anecdotally, uh, obviously, a lot of people are looking to uh, cannabis derivatives for managing pain and other symptoms. And, and uh, anecdotally, it seems to be beneficial for some people. And I hope we'll have better studies to better understand uh, some of the, the long-term safety and effects of that therapy. But I, I think it is an option, certainly, in Canada. So why do I feel exhausted? And do you have any advice for improving energy levels? Uh, I would be the most popular guy in uh, Ontario if I had a good answer to this, but I, I will tell you that it's probably one of the most common uh, concerns raised by people with uh, IBD, but I think it's also a common concern in the population in general. And that's why I say, if you look at approach to fatigue, well, well what is normal? You know, sometimes we have uh, unrealistic expectations of our And, and uh, it may not be the idea it's something that we expect of ourselves. And I think we have each of us has to think about this if we're dealing with fatigue. There are medical causes of fatigue, and certainly active inflammatory bowel disease will cause you to feel tired because your body's fighting a, a war inside that it doesn't need to fight, and that's exhausting. Uh, low blood levels, low iron levels, low B12 levels can all uh, contribute to fatigue. And there are other things, of course, outside IBD. You, know, you could have low thyroid act activity. You could be uh, depressed, which can lead to a lot of fatigue. And so we have to think outside IBD itself. Again, exercise, I think, is important. And I think uh, general things like better sleep hygiene will be important. This is probably beyond the scope of practice of your gastroenterologist. And that's why engaging your family doctor in these discussions, I think will be very important uh, to look at uh, non-IBD related 
uh, causes of fatigue as well. I'll show you this because we just had a, there's a big European meeting a, a month ago, although it was virtual, so no one got to go to Europe for the meeting. But this was an interesting study which was presented. I won't go through in detail. It's a small study, 40 people with IBD who uh, complained of fatigue. And they had a, they did a randomized control, they call it crossover design. Won't go through the details, but they basically gave half the people uh, thiamine, half the people placebo. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, interestingly, the people who got the thiamine felt a lot better. So I think we need to understand why, uh, but uh, this is a very simple uh, uh, vitamin that's available over the counter. Uh, the dose was in the study was anywhere from 600 to I think 1800 milligrams a day of thiamine. And interestingly, it seemed to improve fatigue. So this is something I took away from that meeting and something I think we should, we should perhaps try and practice. It's a very benign uh, thing to, to use and maybe there's some benefit. All right, so you have another audience poll question. So if you're living with IBD, which of the following have you been diagnosed with? Other things that can affect IBD patients. So we'll let you vote. Asking you about arthritis or joint inflammation, mouth ulcers or canker sores, skin conditions, eye conditions, or fistulas and abscesses. So we'll let you vote. All right, do we have a do we have an answer? Okay, it's the uh, waiting for the answer. Okay, that's yeah, so the most common complaint. I'm not surprised by that is, is joint pain, uh, but a lot of you are experiencing all the other things on, on the list, but certainly joint pain is the most common thing. And uh, I'm not surprised by that because probably uh, the joint discomforts, uh, again, behind fatigue is probably the second most a uh, common thing that people uh, complain of with uh, with IBD. If you get the slides back here. Yeah. Okay, so these are, uh, this, all these are really what we call extra intestinal manifestations of IBD, because we think of IBD as a gut disorder, but really there, there can be inflammation elsewhere in the body, and that inflammation can affect things like skin, eyes, joints, even liver. And so um, as gastroenterologists, we have to keep these things in mind and, and monitor for them. So um, some of you asked about mouth ulcers. How do you manage them with treatment? And uh, mouth ulcers are, what we call them, you, late term would be canker sores, but in medical world, we call them aphthous ulcers. These are small things, but real uh, nuisances. And I will say that occasional canker sores are normal, but people with Crohn's and colitis and really other systemic inflammation uh, can develop uh, canker sores or aphthous ulcers uh, too with greater frequency and in greater numbers. Some people with Crohn's have multiple aphthous ulcers at, at one time. So things to think about, these can be made worse or can be brought on by low B12 levels, low iron levels, low folate levels, low zinc levels. So it's worth testing for those things and possibly taking supplements. So those are some maybe reversible causes related to nutrition. If you got canker sores, it makes sense to avoid things which are irritating, uh, spicy foods, salty foods, acidic foods, because these can really irritate these little sores and, and make them worse and harder to heal. If they're problematic and you've got IBD, well, again, top of the list is still treating active IBD, because some of these uh, canker sores come and go when the IBD is active or control. So having lots of canker sores may weigh that you're your Crohn's disease is acted up, you may need treatment for the Crohn's itself. But of course, you can use things like saltwater rinses. There's some over the counter for example, that you can dab right onto the canker sore itself with a steroid and an anti inflammatory that can, that can help to heal uh, a bit faster. Uh, but, you know, and in, in rare cases, you know, people need to have. Uh, uh, anti-inflammatory medications, even uh, courses of steroids to, to get these under control, but we do try to avoid doing that. Okay, looks like someone closed my webcam, so that's okay. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about arthritis. What are the causes of arthritis uh, uh, out there? 
Uh, well, I would say again, arthritis and joint problems are a very common complaint for people with IBD. And uh, not all uh, joint pain relates to IBD. And this is important because uh, people can get wear and tear of their joints that has nothing to do with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and, and again, these are very common human complaints. But IBD does increase your risk of inflammation in the joints. And we think about things in axial, which are things related to the spine, the center of the body. And there are a couple of conditions here. Sacroiliitis is probably the more common one. It's the joints that are in this picture that are between the, the bottom of the spine and, the, and the, the pelvic bone. They can be inflamed in some people with IBD, and that needs to be recognized because that needs to be treated. And there are the arthritis that affects the peripheral joints in the, in the upper and lower limbs, uh, and uh, there are different subtypes of that uh, as well. In many cases, treating the underlying inflammatory bowel disease will help the joints. So again, in many cases, the focus goes back to treating the Crohn's and colitis uh, itself. So again, I think if you're struggling with arthritis, it's still important to engage your primary care provider because a lot of joint pain has nothing to do with the IBD. It's, it's just the wear and tear kind of pain that many of us deal with. If it's problematic, we often involve other specialists like rheumatologists to, to see you and to evaluate you. Often treating the IBD itself will help. There are things that don't involve medications such as physiotherapy and exercise that may well be useful. An important note is to try to avoid Again, these NSAIDs like Motrin, Advil, Naproxen, because they can make Crohn's or colitis worse. But there is a prescription drug in this family uh, called Celebrex, which might be a little uh, better tolerated and it's reasonably safe to use in people with Crohn's and colitis, but that would require a prescription in, in order to access it. Again, acetaminophen is fine. And there's an old fashioned medication we sometimes take off the shelf called sulfasalazine uh, that. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of time for this, but just to, it's interesting. This uh, has an interesting history because sulfasalazine was actually first used in the 1930s, so almost 100 years ago. But it was recognized that some people with arthritis also had colitis and the colitis started to get better. And then a very smart person in the 70s figured out, well, sulfasalazine has two things in it, one of which is the 5-ASA that we talked about before. And it's actually the 5-ASA that's helping the colitis and that discovery led to all those medications like Pentassa, Asacol, and Salifol, uh, and Mesovent, which are used to treat uh, colitis. So it's an interesting uh, history of discovery and, and serendipity. So again, just quickly, there are some skin conditions in IBD which are direct, directly associated with IBD, and these are sorry, not very pleasant pictures. But the one on the left is erythema nodosum, where people get these sore lumps or under the skin usually in the lower legs. And this skin finding often comes and goes with the activity of the Crohn's or colitis itself. So if the Crohn's get better, this goes away. If it flares up, these come back. On the right is another skin problem called pyroderma gangrenosum. Not a very pleasant picture, but this is something that can come and go even when the IBD is well controlled and it can be very uh, problematic. And there's, on the right, there's someone with a stoma who's had a an area of pyoderma right next to the uh, stoma, which is developed, and that, that can happen as well. Generally, we involve a dermatologist with this condition because this, uh, this needs very uh, uh, careful assessment and careful treatment, and we really need our dermatology colleagues uh, involved. So this is someone asking if they started biologic therapy six months ago, they're getting some rashes and hives that are itchy. Could this be a side effect of medication? Um, it's possible. I mean, people with uh, any uh, biologic therapy can have sort of allergic reactions to that therapy that could present with things like itching and hives. And I think we have to see if it's happening repeatedly after each dose of the biologic and whether the timing seems to make sense. Uh, but it is possible that, that is a, a, a side effect of therapy. But there are other skin problems that can actually come from anti-TNF therapy. You know, anti-TNF therapy, we're talking about things like Remicade, Humira, uh, Symphony. Interesting, it's been recognized about 5 or 10% of people on these therapies will develop rashes that look a little bit like eczema or psoriasis. And that's really odd because we use these drugs to treat psoriasis, but there are people who've never had psoriasis before, start these medications, and then develop little skin uh, changes that look like psoriasis. It's a, it's a nuisance problem. It's pretty rare for someone to have to stop the medication because of this. 
and in general, uh, they can get uh, creams and things to put on their skin rash that, that make it settle down and they can continue on the medication. But this is a particular skin rash, which may actually be caused by uh, IBD medication. And it's the anti-TNF ones like Remicade, Humira, and Symphony. I'm just gonna go a whole faster for time because you wanna get to some of the questions. Someone else asking if their eyes are often red and bloodshot, could this be associated with uh, IBD? And the answer is yes, it could be. Uh, just like uh, you can get inflammation in the joints when you have IBD, you can also get inflammation in your eyes. And there are different layers of the, of the eyeball. Uh, middle layers, if it's inflamed, is uveitis. The outer layer is called episcleritis. And the inner layer, if it's inflamed, is scleritis. It's a bit complicated, but you can see all of these lead to red and kind of bloodshot eyes. Hard to discriminate this from things like allergies, uh, but uh, if it's a new onset of a problem, and particularly if there's eye pain, if your vision is blurred, or if it hurts to look at the light, those are urgent things that really require an urgent eye assessment through an optometrist, an ophthalmologist, or even an emergency department. So that's important to remember. Sudden eye pain, blurred vision, or uh, pain with light uh, needs an urgent assessment. Distress influence disease activity in people with Crohn's and colitis. And how can I manage my stress? Well, I don't have all the answers to this, but I, I think it is important to know that depression and anxiety are actually more common in IBD patients than in the general population. And that can be even when the IBD is well controlled. That depression and anxiety can increase the severity of the symptoms from IBD, can make diarrhea worse, can make pain worse. Depression and anxiety can uh, make treatment less effective. And of course, in the middle of a pandemic, depression and anxiety is rampant in our society. And it's a real challenge for many of our patients with IBD. And I know that perhaps many of you, but many of my patients have really been struggling uh, with these issues. Early recognition and treatment are key. And although access to care still unfortunately remains challenging in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada, uh, this really needs to be brought to the attention of your healthcare team, including your family doctor as well, because there are services that can be accessed. And this uh, just briefly alludes to the whole idea, everything's related. You know, when you think about anxiety, how, how can it possibly relate to a digestive illness? This is a great study done uh, in Hamilton by my colleagues uh, in the Department of Gastroenterology using a probiotic to treat uh, depression. Uh, and that just tells you that everything is related together. A probiotic might change the bacteria in the gut. And it turns out that the bacteria in the gut may have an influence on brain activity. And so, and it's, it's just fascinating to me how interrelated these things are. And it, so therefore it makes sense that if you have a chronic digestive illness, that you may have things like a mood disorder or anxiety related to your digestive illness. And that leads to a big study, which is being uh, performed across Canada and it's being led by my colleague, Paul Moyetti in, uh, in Hamilton, it's the Imagine study. But its, its goal is to actually look at these relationships between irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and mental health. And uh, a large cohort of 8,000 people is being recruited for the study. And so if your healthcare provider approaches you about this, I really encourage you to participate because there's a lot we need to know about this uh, relationship. So just some messages of hope to conclude with. Uh, this shows you, uh, medications for IBD, the ones in black are the ones that we already have available to us. And that's a big leap over what we had even five or 10 years ago. And everything in red is what might be on the horizon in the near future. We don't have time to go through all this, but I just want to let you know that we're in a golden age of IBD therapy where we have new agents available. And so much better medications to treat Crohn's disease and alternative clinics. So this was the cover from The Economist a week or two ago. Suddenly hope, of course, this relates to the vaccine that's here with us. But I, I think there's also a lot of hope for uh, all of you living with the IBD that your, your future is really going to be uh, much brighter than uh, it would have been 20, 30 years ago. So that, um, I know we're a little short on time. I apologize for maybe speaking a bit too long, but we can go to some questions and answers. Yeah, thank you so much, John. I almost feel like I need to leave my webcam off as well, since you're not on webcam. Um, I, I believe Sarah turned off your webcam because um, there were some uh, internet connectivity issues. Uh, you were breaking off a, a bit here and there. So uh, maybe, oh, there we go. You're back. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully you'll be okay. 
So it's question and answer period. As I indicated, it will be based on questions that have been submitted at, um, uh, during the registration time. But we have been receiving live some really good questions as well. So hopefully, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we'll see how far we can get along before we, uh, we go for the live questions. So next, first question, please, Sarah. So this is about cancer. What types of, I know you covered some, but what types of cancer in particular are most common in people with IBD? And what are the causes? Yeah, I, I think the good news here, the, the common causes, the common cancers of people with IBD are they're really the same as the common cause of cancers of people in the general population, things like you know breast, uh, prostate, colorectal cancer. And most of that has nothing to do with IBD, which is, I think, tells you that IBD only has a very small effect on, on cancer itself. But yes, uh, I think I see in the in the chat box, someone's asking me, but if you've had uh, colitis for a long time, do you have a higher risk of colon cancer? And mm -hmm. the answer is probably yes, but it depends on how much of your bowels evolved and how well controlled the colitis is. If you've got very well controlled colitis, uh, the evidence would suggest that your risk of cancer is, is no different from the general population. But poorly controlled inflammation in the colon over time will increase that risk. Uh, but again, that's another reason to monitor closely and to treat the disease better so that we can avoid those long-term complications. There's also a slightly higher risk of lymphoma in people with Crohn's and colitis. But that's not unique to Crohn's and colitis. That's really any chronic inflammation in the body will slightly increase your risk of lymphoma, but that risk is really very small. Okay. So hence the idea of you really need to, um, you, you showed us that graph where um, during the journey of the, of the disease, um, there's more and more complications. So the key is to prevent and control your disease as early as possible. Um, before I move on to the next question, I, I thought of, um, you mentioned something about the Imagine, Spore, uh, Imagine study and how um, you had indicated to the um, audience that if their interest, if, uh, if their provider uh, reaches out to them about the study to please volunteer, what about if a patient is interested in volunteering? Can they just go to the healthcare provider or how they how can they participate in this study? Yes, yeah, so not directly my study, but I think they could reach out to the study team. They'd have to, yeah, they'd have to go through our, one of the, the registered study centers involved. Most universities in Canada would be uh, involved with this study. So if, um, if you're at a community hospital, maybe asked to be referred to the teaching center or at least uh, they should, your provider should be able to reach out to find out who the study coordinator is at your center. But that would be welcome to do that and in fact, encouraged to do that. Okay. And I suppose the other option is to contact CCC and we'll, we can put you in touch to, with uh, Dr. Paul Moyandi. Okay, Sarah, what was the second question? I think it was about bloating. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so bloating is a very common complaint, a uh, tough one to get rid of too, but and we could talk a long time about this, but just to be brief, I guess, in the interest of answering other questions, bloating is that sense of fullness or gassiness. Um, so some of that reflects extra air that people swallow. So we talk about trying to avoid swallowing air, you know, talking slowly, don't eat while you're, don't talk while you're eating. Uh, don't chew gum or candy. That's a common cause of bloating because you ingest a lot of air when you when you swallow repeatedly. People mm -hmm. who use CPAP machines for sleep apnea often force more air in. Uh, people who are anxious often swallow more frequently and take a bit of air in. Um, carbonated beverages, obviously, as well. And then the other side of it is, well, some foods get digested, they produce more gas. And that's that diet I mentioned called a low FODMAP diet. If you Google that, you'll find all kinds of resources. A low FODMAP diet will reduce the amount of gas that you produce. Probably changing the bacteria might help. I mean, you know, we really don't have good tests to measure this, but you know, maybe robotics will be helpful. Uh, but you know, surgery just for bloating, I think, would be rare, unless the, this was actually a mechanical problem related to a blockage that led to the sense of fullness. In that case, surgery might be the best thing. Okay, thank you, John. Next question. So rectal bleeding, uh, how can you treat this? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one to answer because it depends really on, sorry, I think we went, yeah. I think it depends on what the bleeding is coming from. It could be lots of things, right? So if you're having bleeding, you need to be investigated, ideally with something like a colonoscopy to figure it out. Uh, bleeding can be everything from hemorrhoids to bowel cancer and everything in, be in between. So 
I think the treatment would really depend on what the, the cause is. Most common causes of bleeding are still benign things like hemorrhoids, and they may benefit from local treatment with the anti-inflammatory creams, but also controlling the bowel habit, avoiding straining, avoiding pushing, um, uh, so you don't sort of force these hemorrhoids to bulge and, and burst. But you know, that, the, the answer to that is really, I think the main thing is to try to be investigated to figure out where the bleeding is coming from. So I guess the key is um, go see your healthcare provider. Yes, for sure, if you're having bleeding, yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question. Do you have any tips or general advice for managing fistulas? Yeah, well, fistulas are a common complication of uh, Crohn's disease. Maybe about a quarter of people with Crohn's disease will develop fistulas. You know, they're, they're tunnels from the lining of the bowel, uh, most commonly to the skin around the, uh, around the anus, around the backside. But they can also be internal from bowel to other parts of the bowel or other internal organs. But mostly we're talking about fistulas, which are extra openings around the anus. Um, you know, first of all, there are medications which can try to treat this. And, you know, we, we mentioned anti-TNF medications on one of the slides, things like Remicade, Humira, Symphony. That class of therapy, uh, if you haven't been tried on it, would be potentially helpful and that should be considered with your healthcare provider. But the main thing is to, uh, if you have a fistula, what you really worry about is infection and abscesses. So if that fistula kind of gums shut and fluid builds up above that, that fluid can accumulate, be very painful and get infected. And that's really what you have to worry about. So keeping the exit open is important. And that's when you start talking about having you know, things like sitz baths and uh, warm compresses to try to make sure that exit stays open so that the fluid inside the fish leg can drain out so it doesn't build up and cause an abscess. That would, uh, that would be important. If you are getting fish leg, if you have a fish leg, you're getting a lot of pain underneath the fish leg, you worry about infection and abscess. And again, you should see your healthcare provider about that. You might need antibiotics or you might need a minor surgical procedure to open up the, the, the collection and let it drain. Okay, unfortunately, it is eight o'clock. Uh, maybe we can ask one more question, and then uh, and then we'll unfortunately have to close. As you can see, there's lots of questions here, uh, Dr. Marshall. Uh, so the next question is: Is there a relationship between diet and the occurrence or severity of fistulas and abscesses? Uh, this is an easy one to answer because I'd say that I don't think there's a known relationship there. I, I... I hesitate to say no there isn't because there's a lot I think we need to understand about diet and that's why some of these big studies are being done things like the the gem study for example we haven't spoken about that other very important study but part of that is looking at the relationship between diet and, and things like Crohn's and colitis so I, I would say to, for current understanding there isn't a known relationship between diet fistulas and abscesses but I wouldn't rule that out I think it, it is something that really needs better study but for the moment, unfortunately, there's no dietary therapy or known dietary cause. Okay, wonderful. I think we have at least another 10 or 15 questions uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. And unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, we also had a number of questions coming in through the chat box. Thank you to all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Marshall, for joining us. Very good presentation. I think it was, I learned a lot. I think um, this was one of those presentations, whether you are new, newly diagnosed or ha have had the disease for a while, I'm sure everyone learned something today. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, spending this evening with us. And um, so just uh, for those audience members, let us know how we did um, and uh, what you'd like covered in future webinars. Uh, we will be um, starting a survey immediately after the closure of this webinar. Uh, we encourage you to take that survey. It won't take very long. And this is how we determine what topics we'll be covering for our future webinars. So thank you for your time. Um, and uh, with that, if you, I'm assuming that you follow us, but if you want to keep up to date on what's going on in the Crohn's and Colitis community, learn about our other future events, please do follow us at Gutsy Get. Get Gutsy Canada through the various social media channels. And last, um, if you enjoyed this webinar and um, you, I realize it's COVID-19 and if you have some um, um, additional change or whatnot, um, please do support us through um, texting CURE to 20222 and to donate $25 to continue to support us in, in um, providing these types of web education events and supporting research at Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a good night.